So this video onwards, we'll start our discussion about architecture patterns. And this is undoubtedly the most important topic uh, for technology architects and cloud architects. So we'll start off with the monolith architecture. The monolith architecture, okay? So to show you this properly, I have a few diagrams here. Now this is the most basic uh, bare bones project structure that you start with. So let's say today, when you go to YouTube and you start off with a project, when you have these code along projects like right, like build a social media or build an e-commerce uh, within a code along like in Python or in React, uh, Node.js, whatever, the basic project that you build is always, always a monolith. Monoliths are not supposed to scale a lot because they have the all the entire business logic in one place. You could have a ba load balancer and you could have multiple uh, replications of these um, servers which are containing the entire business logic. But the most important part being the business logic completely resides on one server. There could be a separate server for database, separate server even for front end. But the entire business logic for the back end like catalogs, orders, payments, products, uh, payments, all of that will all reside on just one server in just one place or in just one project. And that's a problem because... Uh, it starts becoming a mess very quickly. It becomes very difficult to maintain, very difficult to scale. There's not much of uh, <clears throat> differentiation and uh, isolation between them. So if one thing goes down, everything else goes down at the same time. But uh, a couple of videos back, we learned that cloud-native architectures, cloud-native uh, projects, let me scroll back there again. Cloud-native projects need to have a little bit of... Um, Isolated isolation amongst components and boundedness uh, with the context among components. So even though you have bounded components here, like the whole everything is bounded together, but you don't have isolated components and uh, one issue in one place will lead to an issue throughout the entire um, structure, the entire project. Now, um, sometimes it's difficult to understand what monoliths are in isolation. So when you look at it from uh, in comparison with microservices, then you're able to understand it much better. So. When you start off, you have a monolith architecture where all the business logic is in one big blob. And whereas in microservices, we have not talked about microservices yet, and we'll be covering microservices in a lot more detail later on. But all you need to understand is, it, is that from monolith, when you start uh, <clears throat> dividing the business logic according to some, some criteria or some categories, starts uh, you start to tend towards going towards something called as a microservices uh, architecture. In microservices, all of your business logic is in different components altogether, and there could be separate data databases for separate business logic. This creates a lot of isolation between all these different modules, and that means that if one module goes down, like if the products module goes down, doesn't mean that the payments and the orders module will go down as well. Or if the orders goes down, the user can still browse all the products, right? So it creates a lot of um, isolation, <clears throat> creates a lot of, uh, and it leads to high availability and high resilience in the entire architecture. So this is why you start moving from monolith to microservices. Now I have one more diagram for you. So here you had monolith first when you had users, threads, and posts. So this is assuming a discussion board kind of a thing, right? Like almost like a Reddit. But slowly when you move toward microservices, the user service became something else. This is uh, getting divided based on different um, business criteria. Right? So user service became something else, thread service became something else, and post service became completely something else, right? So they all became separate. Now they become easy for us to manage. So even from a development standpoint and a maintainability standpoint, you could have a separate team working on the user's microservice. They, could be, they would be only uh, concerned about building new features in the user's microservice or changing uh, any features in the user's microservice. There could be a separate team for post's microservice. So if these people, they want to deploy something today, they can do that. And if users want to deploy, uh, the developers working on users want to deploy something tomorrow, they could do that completely independent of each other. If this goes down, doesn't mean the user service uh, will go down as well. Everything is separated out here. So uh, one more thing that I want to show you is that in monolith architecture, since there's so many requests happening here and there, uh, it ends up becoming something called as a unitary architecture or, or a big ball of mud where the entire business logic is cramped together and you're making requests to the entire business logic. There's no, um, there's no clarity as to what's happening uh, in this monolith architecture, okay? So I hope this was a clear introduction to monoliths and uh, slowly we'll start moving towards, uh, you know, all the other architectures one by one. 
to the point of mic- microservices and we'll go a little further as well but these are the most um, common and the most important micro- uh, architecture patterns there could be many more i have not covered them here uh, but these are the most common ones that you'll come across and then you'll probably implement in your projects thanks a lot for watching and i'll see you in the next video uh, do subscribe if you haven't already i hope you're getting a lot of value here because this is content that doesn't exist on the internet